Hi. Hello. How are you? Welcome to Chapman World. So today I'm going to show you how to use Pass2.js, which is a Pascal to JavaScript transpiler, to use Lazarus to build web pages and possibly server-side applications as well. So we'll start by taking a look at browser applications, and then I'm going to experiment with Node applications, which may not work. I've not actually tried it yet, um, but it's supposed to work. It's reported to work, so we'll see if we can get that working today as well. Now, in order to do this, we're going to need the Pass to JS compiler, which can be installed from FPC Up Deluxe. So, if you watched my first video on uh, what are Free Pascal and Lazarus, including an installation guide, then you'll already be aware of FPC Up Deluxe, and we've already used that to install uh, most of the desktop compilers. And then in my previous video on deploying to Android, we also installed the Android compiler for it. Because this is JavaScript, you won't need the Android compilers, but you will need to have Lazarus installed. So it's worth going back to my first video if you've not already seen it uh, to understand how to install Lazarus with FPC Up Deluxe. And that's where I'm at right now. So I'm going to open up the FPC Up Deluxe tool. And you can see I'm on the, strunk, the trunk install here. Uh, I'm going to come across to modules, and we're going to select the Paz to JS module which is, this is alphabeticalized, why can I not see it? Pass to JS, there it is, Pass to JS. So this is Pass to JS RTL, this is the runtime library that's being written to support the Pass to JS uh, transpiler. So we're gonna go ahead and install that module. Now with Pass to JS installed here, we need to go install it into the Lazarus IDE. So we're gonna come into our IDE here, and up to packages, install and install packages, and find the, the pass to JS integration package, which is here, pass to JS design. So I'm gonna double click that to put it over in the install, and then save and rebuild the IDE. Okay, so the IDE has rebuilt, and we have pass to JS. So let's go ahead and take a look first at some of the options that have been added. If we come into tools options, uh, if we take a look under pass to JS, this is the path to our path to JS transpiler. That's our compiler path. Uh, this is a path to an optional web server that you can run your applications in. I've not actually tried that web server yet, so it might be interesting to give that a try. Uh, then we have access, uh, a, a path here for our browser. Now, what's supposed to happen is when you hit run without debugging, your application gets launched in uh, the browser of your choosing, which is set by this option. Um, but unfortunately, I've not been able to get that to work yet, so I've been manually opening the HTML page in a browser myself. Um, it may be that I need to be running inside of this web server to make that option work, or it may be missing functionality. Uh, as I've said in a previous video, the Pass to JS code is still a little rough around the edges. So I've not managed to get that to work yet, and I've not yet even tried Node.js. I'm going to try that later in the video, and things may or may not go well. So we'll see what happens when we try it. Um, but effectively, those are the options that you have to play with when you install this package. Now, I should mention here that um, the Pass to JS compiler actually has been around for quite some time. But for the longest time, it was kind of a novelty in the Free Pascal code base. It was kind of a sample slash novelty uh, tool. And it only really got more focus in the last 12 to 18 months, I want to say, um, because of a collaboration between one of the Free Pascal's original authors, um, Michael, I don't want to mispronounce the name, so I'm not going to, um, and the guys from TMS. Uh, the collaboration between these people led to Pass to JS getting a lot more uh, attention, and Pass to JS actually, I believe, is now a part of under various licensing conditions that uh, licensing agreements between the two uh, is now a part of the TMS Web Core technology. So very interesting that it's able to create uh, what is actually quite a rich framework of. Uh, UI tools for Delphi. Uh, so it's very interesting that this is available to us in Lazarus as well, and we should be able to do some fun things with it, though there are a few limitations and we'll cover those. As I said, I think it's still a little rough around the edges. Uh, certainly the integration with Lazarus has a few uh, quirks. So let's get started with uh, building a project. So I'm going to go File, New, and we have two new options in here. We can create a web browser application or a Node.js application. As I've said, I'll try Node.js later. I've not tried it yet. We're going to start with a web browser application. Okay, 
Uh, and we have a, a series of options here. So we've got create initial HTML page. Well, that's useful. It's going to create the HTML page that will load our JavaScript for us. Uh, maintain HTML page. I'm going to leave this turned on, but I don't believe it's actually functioning. Um, I'm not sure what other features it supports, but the one feature I expected it to uh, doesn't seem to be working. So I'll show you that in just a moment. Uh, run the RTL when all page resources have fully loaded. So in browser applications, you can have your application start immediately when the JavaScript and HTML have loaded. Now, at that time, the web browser might be doing other things. It might be downloading images or audio or you know, arranging text or running the CSS, whatever it might be doing. Uh, it can be doing other things. And so you can have your application start immediately at that time, knowing that those other resources are still loading and therefore may not be available yet. Or you can select this option uh, that says, wait until the browser sends an onloaded event saying that the page has finished loading. Uh, and once the page is finished loading, then you run the RTL, which will eventually run our code. Uh, so I'm going to select that because I like the idea of knowing that all of my resources are loaded before I start working with the application. But if you find yourself in a situation where a page takes a long time to load, it's useful to know that you can set this to the other option and have the code start running earlier. Um, do I want a browser application object or a console application object? So this is going to create a T application style object for us. Anybody that's familiar with Delphi or Lazarus will be aware of T application. Now, that's a, to my way of thinking at this point, it's a nice to have because it's familiar. But I don't think in terms of a browser application, it really makes all that much sense. The reason is browser applications have a very different life cycle to desktop applications. They may be long running. You might have a timer that continues to uh, run an event, or you might have a loop keeping the JavaScript running. Uh, but typically, or I won't say typically, but the basic life cycle of a JavaScript application is to start running and end running, and then the page is loaded, okay? Or then the, uh, the JavaScript has done its job. Um, it's not typical, uh, or it's not, uh, necessary to have a looping application. Now you may have a looping application. Uh, HTML JavaScript applications have become much more sophisticated uh, and so uh, certainly than you know the, a decade or so ago, much more sophisticated these days and can have full-blown UIs and things like that. But what we need to keep in mind is that HTML was never really designed for building applications. It was designed for displaying text and Graphics. It was designed for displaying documents. JavaScript, fundamentally, when it was first written, was not for writing applications. It was for making the HTML dynamic. It was for putting in little bits that change in the HTML as you're viewing the document. It was basically to embellish the HTML with um, more interactive, fluid activity. Now, you know, in the, the decade and a half, two decades since, it's taken on a completely different form and it is used for, you know, since Ajax, it's been used for uh, UI applications and for IO and all that kind of stuff. Uh, that was never its original intended purpose. So JavaScript uh, was effectively supposed to run, make its changes to the HTML and end. Uh, and its, its legacy is still there, though it is now a much more capable tool. So the reason that I say that these browser uh, objects don't really make that much sense in the JavaScript context is these classes really exist to manage the underlying operating system with regards to UI forms. You know, we add forms into an application and the application object marshals the events being sent to those forms effectively. And such a thing doesn't really exist in the JavaScript world, doesn't really exist in our uh, application, but it is a nice comforting thing for Pascal developers to see. So I am going to select one of them um, and we should understand which of them is uh, val useful for selecting. So the browser console unit basically creates an application that uh, doesn't interact with, that is only really to interact with the console. So it's for sending logging messages to the console. And the console is uh, only really visible for uh, in developer mode. So if we go into our browser and enable the developer tools, then we can see the console output from our application. Uh, the browser application object, on the other hand, 
It's still going to give us access to the console, but I believe that this browser application object will also give us access to things, uh, utility functions for working with the document object model and the uh, browser window itself. And those are also available globally. We don't necessarily need them, but they're nice utilities to, to have in an application object. So I'm going to select that. And as I've said, I've not yet tried working with this uh, HTTP server option. I might give that a go before we move on and look at, uh, at uh, Node.js. Um, but this project needs a HTTP server. There are some features and functionalities within uh, a browser application that do depend on a server, typically for security reasons. So for example, uh, if you do anything to draw graphics with uh, SVG, uh, if you then want to save the image that has been drawn, uh, I think it might be the same with Canvas, I don't recall, but uh, SVG I'm pretty sure is this way. In a typical browser application, you would right click on the image and save to file. If you have done that and it the application is running from a file on your disk and not from a server, then you actually have uh, issues saving to a file because of various security concerns, the browser won't let you do it. Uh, and there are a couple of other things like making HTTP requests. Um, for example, making a HTTP request to localhost uh, is disabled by default in the browser. You need to enable security options for it. So there are cases where you would need a HTTP server. What we're doing today does not. Uh, we're just going to load this from the HTML file on disk. Now, the integration with Lazarus is supposed to be able to launch your application for you. And in my case, that's not working, as I'll cover in just a moment. Uh, it may be that it's not working because I'm not running this server. Okay. But I'm not going to uh, include that right now. Let's go ahead and get a good look at our application here. So effectively, before taking a look at it, I'm going to go ahead and save this off. So I'm going to hit Save All. And I have a path to JS directory already created. So I'm going to put a new folder in here and we'll say browser, uh, hello browser. Okay. And we'll save the project as hello browser. And then the HTML file, this also I'm going to save as hello browser. Could save this as index.html, for example. Uh, but I'm just going to save it with the same file name as the project for right now. And what we get is a project with an LPR. So the LPR file is our program source and a HTML file. If we go and take a look at the directory, that has a couple of additional files. So it has our project information file and it has our uh, project state or our ID state file. So the state file just contains things like if I set a breakpoint, it would store the breakpoints that I've created. The LPR, the LPI file contains a link to the LPR so that we know what to build when we're building this project. Uh, and then we have our HTML file right here. Okay. So one thing you will notice is there's no JavaScript file in here yet. And that's because we haven't built the application. So let's go ahead and make sure we can build it now. Uh, so I'm going to go file run build. And it seems to have built. If we take a look back in the directory here, we now have a hello browser.js file. Uh, and there's actually a JS directory which really just stores the compiled uh, units. So uh, this, I guess, could be comparable to a lib directory with a native desktop application. Okay, so we've got our HTML and our JavaScript file, but we do have a problem. If I open up the HTML here, you can see that it's stuck on project1.js. Now you'll remember I said that I didn't think the maintain HTML option was working when we looked at it. Uh, this is the reason why. I would have hoped that it would at least have changed the name of the JavaScript file to hello browser.js, which is the file that we actually need. So I'm going to go ahead and change that manually now. And save that off. And then we need to run the application. Again, another feature that I said doesn't seem to be working for me, possibly because I'm not running inside of a server. I can click run without browser and nothing appears to happen. Okay. So uh, what I'm going to do instead is open the file manually. And maybe when I'm running a server, that option will work for me later. So I'm going to come over to a second desktop here and I'm going to open my source directory. Let me make sure you can see this. So here's our Hello Browser application. And I'm just going to double click on the HTML file. And what we get, too many screens here, is the Hello Browser application, which is completely empty because we've not yet done anything with it. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead. I'm in the Firefox browser. You can, of course, use uh, the browser of your choice. 
Um, but I'm going to go ahead and open up the developer tools in the Firefox browser. I believe it's Control F11 uh, in Chrome. Please don't quote me on that, but there is a menu option to get to the developer tools in Chrome as well, of course. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and toggle the tools on here. And if we take a look uh, at our, let's see, console output, there is nothing because we've done nothing. Uh, can we view the files? Yes, here we are. So this is our HTML file. You'll see it's including our Hello Browser JS. And if I click into that, can, will, it, will it take me to it? Yes. So what we can see here is we have the runtime library, the RTL, uh, from Lazarus. And within here, we should find a do run method. Uh, so actually, I found where it's being called. So we are in uh, the run function of the RTL. So let's let's walk this down from the HTML file. If we go and take a look at the HTML, you can see this script event here, add event listener load, so that's when the document has loaded, call rtl.run. So then looking in the RTL, we just saw rtl.run, it's this function right here, that's gonna call do run. Now do run is actually in our source code, we can go and take a look at that in a moment. Um, so that do run is gonna call our code, execute it, and finish. So let's switch back to the Lazarus IDE here. And this is our do run method. So effectively our program has application create, uh, application initialize, application dot run. And that's gonna call this uh, internally, is gonna call this do run method. And so our code begins here. Okay, so. Before we actually put any code in here, there's one more thing that we need to take a look at. So let's look at our users list. We have here classes and sysutils. I'm not going to cover those. Uh, if you are a Delphi or Pascal developer, you probably are already very familiar with classes and sysutils. I believe under pass 2 js these units are limited in various ways. Not sure exactly what those ways are. We'll come back to that. Uh, but under browser, or rather we won't come back to that, you can discover that, uh, under browser app, JS and web, these are the three units that we're interested in. These give us access to the, um, the JavaScript engine, which is running inside of a browser. So uh, if you're running Chrome, for example, it'd be the V8 engine. I think it's called Spider something in uh, Firefox. Uh, this is the JavaScript engine we're going to get access to. If you're running a Node.js application, there's no browser, but you still have the V8 engine. So uh, Node.js, I believe, is always the V8 engine from Chrome. It's been integrated. Google made it a separate project. And then, um, forget the guy's name, begins with an R, integrated it to create Node.js. So these are the interesting units for us. They're going to give us access to the functionality of the engine or the browser. And if I click in the web tab here, this is web because it's specifically for web browsers. If I scroll down, you can see that we have access to three global objects. We have document, window, and console. Now the console, as I've said, is for logging console for uh, developer purposes, and we can take a look at that uh, in a moment. The window and document objects, well, window is our global object in the case of a JavaScript application. Every variable is parented in some way, either directly or indirectly to window. The document is the document object model. It's parented to window. Uh, window is the environment that we're running in. And we can also use this to get the uh, actual properties of the Firefox or Chrome window, its width, its height, whatever. So we can get the browser window details from uh, that object. And we have access to document. Now this is the document object model. If you're not familiar with the document object model, um, and you want to do any kind of web programming, whether it's in JavaScript or Lazarus, you need to learn about the document object model. So this basically is a model for the HTML page in which our application is running. It gives us access to the HTML tags and is therefore our access to the UI. It's access to everything we need to render what we want to render as output and to receive input from the, uh, from the user of the browser. So uh, document is a very important global there. So that's in the web unit. Let's take a brief look at the JS unit because this is quite a useful one as well. Uh, so this has many, many classes that represent uh, the JS object, of course, being uh, Pascal. We're going to call it TJS 
object. Uh, but this is effectively, as JS developers would know it, the JS object. This is the root of all other classes in JavaScript. So if we want to import classes from JavaScript, that is doable, and uh, maybe we'll have time to cover that as well. Um, that's uh, This is the base class that we would be inheriting from. And then there are a bunch of other classes for dynamic arrays, dynamic array of array. Uh, we have access to iterators, uh, which are effectively method handlers for iterating through objects. Uh, we have uh, JS set, not really familiar with that. Uh, JS map, we should in here find, uh, so we've got the JS date class for working with date time. Uh, and if we scroll down, we'll find in here somewhere JS element. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, it's not in this unit. Let's go and take a quick look. Is it maybe in the browser app unit? No, it should be in here. Element. I'm just going to quickly skim through and see if I can find JS element, JS HTML element. Ah, can't find the one I want. Maybe it's in this file. Yes. Okay, it's in the web file uh, rather than the JS file. Uh, so this is, again, another imported JavaScript class, but this actually rep represents a HTML element, a tag. Uh, so effectively, if you have a, the body tag or a div tag or something like that, it would be represented by a JS element. And using this, we can gain access to, if we look at the uh, methods and properties here, we should be able to gain access to, we can certainly gain access to the events of uh, the element, so we can gain access to on drag, on drop, on error, on focus, and so on. So those are our event handlers. Should be able to gain access, I think, here to the attributes as well, but I'm not seeing it. Maybe that's in the derived class. So we take a look at, uh, this is derived class external HTML element, JS element. Let's take a look at JS element. Yes, so this would be our base class, and it has access to get to the attributes that are on the tag as well. So we can change the style, the color, and so on from our JavaScript. Okay, so armed with that knowledge, uh, and let me just put that in a, a concise point. So effectively, what we get access to with Pass2JS is the all of the classes and functionality that are available to a JavaScript application. So we get access to the document object model and all of the HTML elements. We get access to things like uh, WebSockets APIs and uh, uh, HTTP requests. We can make HTTP requests and do uh, REST calls and we get the JSON parser and a whole weft of different functions and uh, features and functionality are available. That's what we get access to. But we get access to them without having to deal with the JavaScript syntax, which in my opinion is not a great syntax. I've never been a fan of it. Um, I don't mind certain uh, C-based syntaxes, but I, I think that the JavaScript syntax is not a shining example. Um, thankfully, I'm a big fan of Pascal, and with Pasta.js, we get most Pascal syntax features uh, while still getting access to pretty much everything that the JavaScript engine uh, provides. So that's precisely why we might want to be doing this. So let's go ahead and armed with that knowledge, do something in our browser. The first thing that I want to do is gain access to the body tag of my HTML document. So if we go and take a look at the HTML, there's the body tag. I want to gain access to that. Now, browsers, when they pass HTML, are really quite forgiving. Um, the syntax of HTML is not incredibly strict. And that is by design. Uh, there are strict modes for HTML now, but fundamentally going back to the very uh, inception of HTML, the idea was that HTML would display a textual page, possibly embellished with images, links to other documents. Um, but if there was a formatting uh, syntax error in the HTML, that shouldn't crash the whole document, okay? The whole document should still be displayable just with the one piece that's broken, not showing. So browsers are very forgiving, meaning that you could have, for example, a second body element in your HTML. And I don't believe the browser will complain on this. Now, as I said, some browsers have a strict mode these days, so maybe it will complain, but let's find out. Yeah, just goes right ahead and parses it just fine. Uh, no errors or warnings or anything. Uh, there are two body tags in my document now. So uh, for that reason, if we want to gain access to the body tag, 
we're going to ask the document object model to give us all tags which are of class or type body. But we only want the first one because we know that our document has two of these things uh, and we only really want that first one. In fact, we can be pretty certain our document only has one because we're going to remove the second one. Okay, but for that reason, the object that we want is going to be returned in a collection. So let's get started. We're going to do document dot and I get my uh, auto completion get element by I believe it's tag name is what I want and you can see there in the autocomplete uh, pop-up we've got TJS HTML collection so I'm going to get a collection of objects back um, okay I want the body tag and of the collection that I get back I want the zero element I know that there is at least one body tag and I want the first one okay so that's going to return to me a TJS uh, I believe we just looked at it. Uh, that's going to return a TJS element. Now, the TJS element is not necessarily a HTML element, which we do want. So I'm going to create a variable to receive this. I'm going to call it body tag TJS HTML element. And I want to set body tag to that element. Now, I'm not going to be able to just do that because uh, this is returning a different class type and we are, in Pascal, strongly typed. So I'm going to typecast it. TJS HTML element of the body tag. And I can be confident that the tag that I've got does support the TJS HTML element because the body tag is a HTML element. So I can be confident that the uh, class is supported and we can typecast it safely. Okay, so I have the body tag. Now I want to create a new tag within that. So I'm going to create one called a div. And I'm, if you see me looking off to the left here, it's because I have some notes that I prepared earlier. Uh, so I'm going to create another TJS HTML element. And that's my div. And so what I need to do is create this div. So I'm going to do a div dot, uh, or a div rather, colon equals. And then I'm going to use the T my application class. You remember I said it may have some useful functions. Well, it does. It has this create HTML element method. And that takes the name of the tag that we want to create and an ID for it. So I don't know how much I want to explain every bit about how HTML works, but I'll briefly explain this. Uh, the tag that we're creating is the tag name. So let's go take a look at this. Uh, in the body, for example, the tag string that we're being asked for here should be body because that's the name of the tag but the tag can also have an id attribute and the id attribute is uh, intended to be a unique id because it's very useful in css to be able to look up tags uh, by their id um, there are also classes you could create a tag class attribute and have multiple tags have the same class and again, that's for the benefit of CSS to be able to look that class up. Um, so optionally, we can provide an ID here. I think I'm going to just for the sake of, of doing it, uh, but we're probably not going to do anything with it. So as I said, we have that method on self, on our application object, to create HTML element. And we're going to create a div tag. And I'm going to give it an ID of my div. Okay, now you'll you'll notice that that method, uh, I had the IntelliSense up, we go take another look, actually returns a HTML element. So we've created a HTML element now, um, but the technically the parent of this HTML element right now is the browser window, not the document. Uh, and that's because anything you create, as I said, inside of a browser when it's running is parented to the window. So we need to parent this not only to the uh, to the document, but actually to our body tag within the document. So what we need to do is say body tag, and I believe it's append, append. Uh, and these methods that I'm calling, by the way, uh, for the most part, will be the same methods that you'll find in JavaScript tutorial uh, or documentation information. Uh, they're just translated to Pascal script for our convenience here. So I'm going to add the a div uh, object to my body tag. And then just so that we can see it when we refresh the page, I'm going to go a div. And it has a inner HTML property. Uh, so this is any HTML that we want to appear and get parsed within our div tag. Uh, I'm just going to put in a string, hello browser. 
And so at about 35 minutes or so into the video, I don't know when I edit this where we'll be, uh, finally we might actually get to see something in our browser here. If I come up and do build, and I switch over to our browser and do a refresh. Hello browser. And if we take a look at the document here, we can see that we have our body and our div ID, my div has been added and its content are the words, hello browser. So yay, we have the ability to interact with a HTML page uh, from within our JavaScript. So let's take a look now at something else. I'm starting to venture, this is a, you know, hello, hello browser is about as far as I got with my experimentation with this, uh, though I did try a few things with classes that we'll look at. Um, but uh, we're starting to enter the territory that I'm not too familiar with how to proceed, but we're going to try writing something to the console as well. So let's see if we can get access to our console object. And I guess we have a write or log. We have a log. We could log a JavaScript value. Uh, I wonder if we have access to write them. Okay, so let's see if that builds. And does it run? Yes, it ran. And if we look at the console, do we get our message? Log message to console. So uh, we can actually see here that that came from system.paz line 594. It's fantastic. We get some information of how to translate back to our source code in Pascal. So that's where the console output appears. Obviously, uh, anybody looking at your web page is never going to see that. So, okay. Let's go back and see if we can do something uh, just a little bit more uh, advanced. And again, I'm looking at my notes here. Yeah, okay, so let's create a... Uh, let's go ahead and create a unit and a class. So I'm going to start a new unit. And let's say that we're building a UI framework for developing our web apps. And we want to create a, uh, let's say, a bar that goes all the way across the document. Um, and we'll call it, a, call it a title bar. So we're going to call our framework web framework and our bar will be title bar. Okay, so we're going to create a new class here. Now, I don't believe I'm going to need classes or sysutils. Uh, I don't think the browser mode really counts, but I'm going to set this to Delphi Unicode anyway, because that is the mode I'm more familiar with. I hope that the compiler doesn't complain at that. Uh, and then I'm going to come back here and take these three units that we have had added automatically for us. I'm going to use those in. Okay, and then Let's put these all on their own line. Let's get the formatting the way I like it. Uh, and then we'll take the name of our unit and we're going to save this off. Uh, I guess we could create a units directory just to keep everything separated. Units. And we'll save that off into the units directory. Uh, yes, I want to add that path. And then if we look back at our project source, we need to put the unit name in there as well so that we can use a sit. And we're going to create a new class. So we're going to create type t title bar equals class. And I'm going to put in a private uh, section here, if I can type straight today. Uh, and I'm going to put in a reference to our body tag, which I'll pass into the constructor. We don't necessarily need to do this. We could go look up the body tag again from the JavaScript engine. Uh, but I like to pass things down the framework. Uh, in a Pascal style way or in a VCL slash LCL style way. Uh, so I'm going to keep a reference to my body tag this way. And this is a TJS HTML element. Okay, and then uh, I'm going to create a div tag again. So TJS HTML element for my div. Uh, and then let's give it a color property. For the moment, I'm just going to make that property a string because in HTML, just about everything is a string. We could write code, of course, to translate from actual color values to the string that we need. Uh, but for the moment, I'm just going to give it a, a string. Now I'm going to do public constructor create. And into the constructor, I want to pass, I guess I could just pass it as a const. Const body is our TJS. HTML element, so that's our body element that we want passed in. 
reintroduce because we're deriving uh, actually we don't need reintroduce here we could just do over override because we're not deriving um, T interface object which I'm uh, typically used to uh, and we can actually put a destructor in though the destructor would not get called because I said uh, as I believe I said earlier I may have uh, cut this in an edit um, the destructor <coughs> The PAS to JS compiler doesn't actually support destructors. Everything in JavaScript is automatic reference counted, uh, and so we don't need to destroy anything. So we're going to <clears throat> so we're going to start with our constructor here. Uh, what does this not like? UU char. Whoops. Okay, for some reason my autocomplete is not working in this unit. I will figure that out later, but for the moment I'm going to come and do this manually. So I'm going to copy my constructor in, and this is ttitlebar dot create and inherited. Okay, and within here we're going to store our reference to body. So we'll store that away. And we'll create our div, so uh, we should be able to copy that from our uh, project file here. So we'll take a div is self dot. Well, that's not exactly what we want. We want f div. That's our div tag, and we don't actually need self. We should just be able to do uh, yes document dot document dot create element in this case. Create element. And I'm going to take the ID off because I'm actually now accessing the create element method. Let's go and take a look at this. DOM, oops, DOM create element. So the create element has a slightly different uh, prototype. Uh, you can pass in options, which are optional parameter, but what we really care about is the tag name, and there is no parameter for ID. So this is the document object in JavaScript. Uh, you, as you saw, I just did a quick search, and I can find the create element method documentation there. Uh, so I'm going to pass in create element div to create my div element. And then what I want to do, then what I want to do is to add the div tag to my body. So we're going to do f body dot append f div. Starting to have typing issues. Oh, uh, I need to remember to cast this as a TJS HTML element because that's what we're going to get back from it. Uh, and then we append it to our div, uh, append our div to the body rather, and then we can start setting the attributes of our div. Now we could provide a CSS class at this point, but I'm just going to go ahead and put some attributes in manually. Uh, so we want f div. ATTRs, because that's the abbreviation of attributes. We're going to set the width attribute uh, to be 100%. So hopefully that's going to set the width of this uh, div to the full width of our web page. Now, my HTML skills are rusty at best, so uh, I may need to adjust things. Uh, and then we're going to set some style properties. So fdiv ATTRs, and we'll set a style. I don't need the colon. Uh, so effectively, we're going to set some uh, CSS style information here. Um, now, in CSS, the cascading style, style sheets, uh, typically if we include a style sheet, its classes get applied first, and then inline uh, CSS, which I'm about to add, will be applied on top of that. So this could be used to override a CSS class in code, if that's what you needed to do. So I'm going to say background color and we need to set a color tag. Uh, actually, we have a color property. Should I set the color property? Yeah, I'm going to use the color property here. So f color is from our color property uh, and then we'll set the uh, semicolon and then we'll set the text alignment to center because being a title bar, I want my title in the center of the bar. Okay, so we've created this class, which is going to set some very basic properties. 
including f color. Now f color doesn't have any default. So if we do f color, uh, we'll set this to, uh, let's see, let's set it to red, uh, full red, full green, and nothing blue. Yeah, I think that, that, that should work. Okay, so uh, then we could put the property on. I'm not going to do that just yet. We'll take a look at that in a moment. Uh, let's come back and modify our source code to create an instance of our class. So we're going to take out this div because we no longer need it, and we're not going to append it. Uh, we're going to take out our uh, inner HTML and write link, take out this div property, and instead we'll replace that with our title bar. It is a T title bar class. And we should be able to do title bar dot create and pass in the body tag. Okay, so having passed that in, there's currently no text in our body tag. Uh, let's go ahead and fix that. We'll have a text property. And we're going to pass in some default text, just the same as we did with the color. Why did I put the default color that far down? Put it up here. And F text we'll just set at hello. Okay, so it's going to give us some default text and to make sure that gets inserted, fdiv dot inner text will set to f text. Okay, let's come back. So we've created our title bar, it has been added to our document. If we build and run that, uh, we do have an issue. Yeah, it doesn't like Delphi Unicode mode. Okay. Object PC, we'll stick with that. Does that work? Yes, okay. So we come down to our constructor, and what's it complaining about? Nothing to be overridden. Okay. So we don't need to override that at all, which means we don't need to inherit. Uh, we probably should inherit from T objects. Let's go ahead and see if it builds. Uh, T title bar not found in this module. Did I copy it incorrectly? Yes, there must have been a typo there. And body should be F body since we've now assigned it. Oh, uh, body tag. Okay. And good, we're compiled. Okay, great. So let's see if that actually functions correctly. And yes, we get a nice bright yellow with hello uh, for our title bar. Great. Okay, so of course we could go in and change a whole number of different uh, attributes and things in the style and effectively begin turning this into a usable control that we can insert into our HTML documents. I'm not gonna go that far in this uh, video today, but I will make public these properties. So we're going to have a color property, which I'm still going to leave it as a string. Uh, read f color write set color and property text string read f text write set text. So what we get here is a couple of setters. Let's go ahead and put those in. So we have procedure set color const uh, say a value. And we'll make that a string procedure set text const value string. Uh, and then we need to populate these. Can I do control shift C now? Yes, I think it was my changing the uh, compiler mode it didn't like there. Okay, so what do we need to do to set these properties? Well, the first thing we should do is make sure we're not setting them to something that's already the same. So if uh, value is equal to f text then begin, exit, get out of here. And then we'll copy that into, actually that's our color property. So we'll copy that into F text and do F color as well. Okay, then we want to set the internal uh, private member F color to value. And down here, F text to value. Uh, but then we need to make sure that that gets applied to our HTML document. So for the F uh, text property here, we're going to come up and set the text. Uh, fdiv inner HTML now gets set to ftext. That should work just fine. The color property is a little bit different. 
because it's stored in our style tag. So what we really should do if we wanted to work with the style tag in particular is keep a copy of the style tag uh, and break it down into the individual properties that we want to set. Uh, I'm not going to go to that trouble today. In fact, all I'm going to do is copy this attribute setting and set F color again. So if, for example, you wanted to have a text align, then you'd need two properties, the color and the text align, and you'd need to build the style from those two properties every time. Uh, I'm not going to worry about that right now. Okay, so to make sure this is working, we want to change things from our defaults. So let's go ahead and make the uh, title bar color. We're going to set this to, let's just set it to red. And if we can even read the text, which we might not be able to, yeah, let's set it to green with blue. I think that will make a very pale green, um, which well, it's not going to make yellow, is it? No. Uh, so that should at least allow us to uh, see the text. And the text will be, this text has changed. Oops. Had that right. There we go build it and it seems to have built so let's go and take a look and see what happens when we refresh ah we get cyan okay so this text has changed and we get our color change property so what if we wanted to put those property changes on an event handler this is something I've really not tried already so let's give it a shot uh, oops I want my browser to stay open okay so can we set an event handler to handle an event Okay, let's take a look at the uh, HTML element. Uh, do we have an on click? Yes, we do. T HTML on click event handler is a reference to a function. Okay, that's interesting. I didn't, I was not aware that the reference to syntax has been added to Free Pascal. In fact, it may not have been. It may be that this syntax has only been added to the uh, pass to JS which is uh, just an interesting syntax difference to note. Uh, okay, well, fair enough. We'll take the event prototype here. This is our click handler, and we'll copy that into our code, and we'll say handle on click, and begin end, and we'll put our title bar stuff to change our proxies into that method, and then we can come in and do title bar on click, and you probably need the at handle on click. And I'm actually going to make the on click part of our custom application class, uh, which is populated for us. Great. And let's see if that builds. Title bar not found. Okay, so it doesn't know about title bar because it's uh, it's an event handle and we've not kept a reference to title bar. Okay, well, let's take our, our title bar here. We'll move that into our application class as a private okay so that's our title bar in our application make it f title bar and anywhere we reference it now it will be f title bar and the event it shouldn't be possible of course to call the event before the title bar has been created because Title bar is not there to click. So, uh, okay, let's see if that builds. Uh, what do you not like? Identify not found on click. Ah, okay, so we don't actually have that event on our title bar as a property. So let's go and add it to our class. And I want to find the, uh, I was just looking at it a moment ago. Okay, this is the function prototype. T HTML click handler. Okay, so we're going to come back in here and we'll give ourselves a new property. Property on click for our event handler. Read f uh, on click. Write set on click. Control shift C to put that in. So we get our setter and has it put an on click in for us? It has. Let's move that to a more appropriate place here. In fact, I'll give it another private section. Uh, so we could we could have this be an events uh, section of private members. Okay, and in the constructor, we want to make sure that gets set to nil. Uh, 
Okay, so we'll default that to nil. And then in our setter, set on click, uh, it's already been written for us. If the values are the same, then exit. Otherwise, set the on click value. Sorry, but I prefer begin and end on everything. Okay, so that gives us our on click event handler. But when we set it, we need to actually set the uh, underlying divs on click. So what we'll do is say f div dot on click becomes equal to f on click. Now, as an interesting side note here for the event, uh, because we don't necessarily need to be able to read the event handler back, it's not typical that you do. Uh, we could remove this f on click reference altogether and try reading it back from the f divs on click. So we could use that as the internal storage potentially. Not going to do that here because I like having the local reference to it, but just as a uh, side thought, and that all seems to compile. So let's see if we've got a working application. Refresh. So we're back to yellow and hello if I click on it. And I've hit a breakpoint. Uh, handle on call. I actually want to just go ahead and run. And maybe I hit a breakpoint because there was an exception. Let's give that a try again. Refresh the page. Click. And I didn't hit a breakpoint because I turned off exceptions. Okay, so let's go ahead and click. And I hit a breakpoint here. Set color. Handle on click, title bar set color. This dot title bar, what is the error message? This F title bar is undefined. Okay, how is title bar undefined? Because we created our browser object, it should be in there. This F title bar is null. And do we, do I ever assign it? Assign it here in the do run. So it is assigned, and I set the on click, and clearly it is assigned because the on click is functioning. So then we come in, and it says it can't find it when we are in this method on the application class. That is interesting. It may be, it may be that terminate is cleaning up. And I don't know what the correct way is to prevent us from terminating here. I wonder if making title bar global will fix this issue. So I'm just going to go ahead and make this a global var. This is not necessarily the recommended way of doing things either, but shift F9 and run this application. Let's go and see what it's doing. Okay, can I get it to work? Yes. Okay, so that explains what the issue is here. So effectively, the T application object at the end of this do run method, T application object is going out of scope and getting freed, which means that it doesn't uh, have a reference to the T title bar object any longer. Uh, and so by making it a global, uh, we're keeping it, basically parenting it to document and keeping it in memory. Um, but that's not actually how we want to work with um, a, a class structure like this. So I guess what we would have to do is create our own application class, which we assign as a global. So we can see that application is a global down here, uh, but it is being freed by the application.free. It's completing that method. We create our own application class, which doesn't get freed, doesn't terminate, uh, and has this as a private member. But I think I've done a little bit more than the typical hello world at this point, so we're going to leave it at that. Okay. So now I want to take a very brief look at getting Node.js working. And I have to say, I've not tried this at all. If this doesn't work, I'm probably just going to end the recording um, because I don't know that I'm going to have success with this. But I'm going to give it a shot all the same. And the first thing we need to do is to get Node.js installed. So if we come to our favorite search engine and search for Node.js, oops, Node.js install for Windows, 
Uh, we can actually come into the Node.js download page. I've already downloaded this, but you can get yourself a copy of the installer. I've gone for the Windows 64-bit installer. Uh, downloaded as an installer like any other. And I'm going to go ahead and run that installer now because I don't have it installed yet. So go ahead and run it. And we get this dialog. It's a simple next, accept, next. Uh, yes, we can stick it in the default location. And yes, and automatically install the necessary tools for what? Some modules need to be compiled with C and C++. I'm probably not going to need those modules, so I'm not going to bother. And install. OK, and there we have it, Node.js installed. So now, that installed into a program files directory. I believe it was program files x86. Nope, it was program files. OK, so that installed into this C program files Node.js by default. I'm going to need that path because I'm going to operate Node.js from a command prompt. So get a command prompt opened up. And I'm actually going to change to my D drive because that's where I'm going to be storing my source. And I'm going to go into source, path to JS. And I'll be creating a, a hello JS or hello node directory in here. Uh, and I need to set my path variable. So I'm going to go to, sorry, let me make this, um, bring this window up a little bit for you. Okay, so I'm going to go to path equals percent path percent semicolon. And then the path that I copied from node. Does it have a bin directory? Let's go and take a look. Uh, node appears to be there, so I believe that's the right path. Whoops. So let's get back to my control prompt. Okay. Node.js. And then we should be able to do node version, I believe. And that tells me I'm on version 12.16.1. Okay, so I have node installed. Now we want to create a node application. So we're going to go into File, New. And this time we want a Node.js application. Uh, use Node.js application object. Again, this is going to get us access to uh, some useful functions uh, for accessing things within Node.js. OK, so we have a project. Let's go ahead and save this off. And I'm going to save this into a new directory, hello node. And that's what I'm going to call my project, hello node. OK, now taking a look at this project, you'll remember that in the, the web browser application, we had several users, uh, which were really quite useful. Classes and sysutils, I'm going to pull out and put up here so that we can look at the ones that are added. This time we have a Node.js app, so that's giving us our T application, T my application class. Uh, and then we have JavaScript, so we still have access to all of the JavaScript objects. But we don't have web uh, because we're not in a web browser. Uh, we have Node.js, so that's where I'm expecting to find, hopefully at the bottom of the file. Yes, we have access to our global object, which is the equivalent of window in a uh, browser application. So that's our global. And we also have console, where, of course, we can send our console output. So we're in a Node.js application. And uh, let me see. I don't know much at all about Node.js. Uh, I've never really worked with it. But um, maybe we can write them. Hello, Node.js. Uh, and let's see if we can make that application work. So what I'm going to do is Try building it. It seems to build. We'll come and take a look at that in our directory structure. Pass the JS. Hello Node. And it's created this hello node.js file for us. That's the file we care about. So back in our command prompt, we are going to go cd uh, hello browser, hello node. Uh, and we're going to say node hello node.js. And it right runs hello node.js. Now, this is fantastic because this means that um, we can actually build both client and server side applications here using Pascal syntax. We are going to have to overcome some of the unfamiliarity of how to access various things in the uh, browser framework and in the uh, in the JavaScript framework, we're going to have to overcome this unfamiliarity that caused the issue that you just saw with me running events. Uh, how do we keep the application running? 
probably involves launching a timer or something of that nature. Uh, but once we over overcome that, being Pascal, we can create classes that take care of that behavior for us. And I can envisage writing an application in which you just write something along the lines of tapplication.create and give it a form name. And then you can have your form build out. And then maybe that form would have a run method because a you know, browser application is essentially one page, uh, and then go off and make the application run within that form. So very interesting possibilities here. Uh, what about having a uh, REST AJAX type service for displaying a UI so that on the browser, uh, on the server side, we can use Node.js to communicate with the browser, but Node.js can also communicate with, say, a TCP socket or a web socket to get access to our native application and allow us to build native applications that can create web UIs. So lots of different sort of options become available to us when we can run Node.js and web browser applications. This video is long enough. Uh, I would love to cover more and explore more with you. As I learn more about this uh, compiler, I will share. But for now, my name is Craig Chapman, and thanks for watching. Like, subscribe, and hit the bell.